<laughs> Hello, all. It's 2.14. We're about to get started. Um, welcome to RAM Symposium. This hour, we are featuring NIH, Belaying the Basics and Beyond. Um, please note that today's presentation is being recorded. The presentation will last approximately 60 minutes. Um, I'm going to keep the participants muted while Julie and Mara are presenting. Um, during the interactive portions, we'll invite you to unmute and use video as you feel comfortable. If you have questions or comments, please use the chat feature if you're online or raise your hand. And I'm assuming in the room that you will raise your hand and get attention somehow that way. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat box throughout the presentation to bring any questions or comments to the attention of the presenters. I will also post a link to the post evaluation survey in the chat. For those of you who are watching it on Teams as well in the chat, you can click the link there to get to the survey. So um, now to our presenters. It's my pleasure to introduce Mara Link and Julie Harvey. Good afternoon. I'm Mara Link. Um, I have been at CSU for seven and a half years. I've done pre and post award in the Department of Biomedical Sciences. I have just in the last few months, weeks, transferred over to doing solely pre-award because the capacity of our pre-award where I'm at is very high. I'm Julie Harvey. I've worked at CSU for about 14 years. I started out as an She was my first research administrator when I started, so she had to train me. <laughs> We'll see how well she trained you. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we're going to do a quick poll. We would like to know if you're, um, how many of you guys do primarily pre-award? We have two in here. And then how many do primarily post-award? One. And then how many do both? Okay. And then probably somewhat similar out there in the um, virtual world. Is that correct, Chris? I'm not seeing any hands up. Okay, that's okay. Okay, so we're going to do just a little history lesson. I have to read it straight off of here because I could not memorize this if I tried. About NIH. Um, NIH began as a one room laboratory in 1887, the Laboratory of Hygiene in a marine hospital on Staten Island in New York. It was located in New York until 1891 when it was moved to Washington, D.C. It is now headquartered in Bethesda, Maryland on a 300 plus acre campus with over 75 buildings. This is the NIH, next slide please. The NIH mission. Um, all proposals should align with the mission of the agency and must provide a statement of relevance of the proposed research project to public health, to public health in the project narrative. We'll talk more on the project narrative down the road. So, and I, oh, next slide. There's 27 institutes and centers at NIH. Each, eight can't talk, sorry. Each institute or center has its own specific agenda and typically focuses on a particular disease or body system with a couple exceptions. They receive funding directly from Congress in the form of an appropriation and each administers their own budgets. Each operates fairly independently, therefore not all use available award mechanisms and not all use them in the same way. Lawrence Tabak officially took um, the role of director of NAH in December of 2021. And there's an example of a lot of the institutes and centers that we use, we don't use all of them, but we do use quite a few of them. The, the N's are the um, institutes, I believe the C's are the centers, and then the OD is Dr. Lawrence's office, or Dr. Cavett's office, correct. Okay. So the next slide, NIH budget is um, 445 billion a year. 84% um, of the funding is awarded for extramural research, largely through almost 50,000 competitive grants to more than 300 researchers at more than 2,500 universities, medical schools, and other research institutions in every state. And as you can see, a huge portion of that is for research. 
They also, um, NIH, NIH also offers regional seminars and currently they're only offered in the virtual setting. I could check. You just yes, here's you checked. So now we have our next slide is award types. We have grants, cooperative agreements, and contracts, not to be confused with grant types or mechanisms. So all program announcements appear in the NIH guide for grants and contracts. Parent announcements are broad funding opportunity announcements, allowing applicants to submit investigator initiated, initiated applications for sp specific activity codes, such as R01s and R21s, and are open for three years and use standard due dates. Not all ICs participate on all parent announcements. Before submitting your application, make sure the institute or center that might be interested in your research is listed as a participating organization in the announcement. Grants are used for both investigator initiated research and more targeted research, such as for an offer financial assistance. Cooperative agreements, NIH expects to be substantially involved in carrying out the project and contracts. The federal government uses contracts as a procurement. I can't even say the word procurement procurement mechanism, usually to acquire property yeah. or services. And I will note that I just learned that the way to tell that it's an unsolicited federal um, proposal or federal solicitation is the fact that it's apparent. I did not know that. Oh, okay. Can, can you elaborate on this a little bit more? On the unsolicited? Mm -hmm. So it, it just they on their website they were saying that a parent announcement or a broad funding opportunity announcement is considered an unsolicited. Mm -hmm. And in KR, where we have to know the type of solicitation mm -hmm. it was, I should note that it's not solicited on those. So, mm -hmm. I had so all know. RFPs would be solicited. What? The RFAs would be solicited. RFAs, RFPs are solicited, yes. Mm -hmm. And then NIH also has loan repayment programs. So then we have on the next slide our grant types. Um, they're offer, also referred to as grant or award mechanisms. Uh, they also do, um, we do a lot of the R grants, research grants at CSU. We do have um, quite a few of the K award, career development awards, some of the research training and fellowships, and um, probably some program project center grants, but not as many. Probably not. And then we do have a lot of the cooperative agreements to use. So getting started on your grant, number one, number one thing you have to do is read your solicitation carefully. Even if you know that solicitation inside and out from last year or two years ago or three years ago, they make changes. They like to make changes. So make sure that you're reading it. It should contain all the information needed to prepare a proposal. So also you want to carefully read the FOA um, for search the FOA for budget information. It'll tell you if there's any uh, limitations, if there's any caps. For example, maybe there's no construction allowed. Um, also, there could be a limit on the amount of travel or where you can travel, um, as, or there may be travel required for the PI. Oftentimes, I have a particular PI that if the travel is required, he's not going to put it in the budget because he'll just cover it out of funds he has, but it actually has to go into the budget. Um, also, sometimes I'll tell you that the total cost cannot exceed a certain amount each year. Cost sharing with NIH is typically for funds over the salary cap only, and we'll discuss that a little bit later. Um, then we're also, next slide please. So this is a typical FOA. Um, let's do a quick pop quiz. We'll see uh, if you're out in the virtual audience, please go on and either, actually, if you can just type in your answer, that would be awesome. So this is your announcement number or your funding opportunity announcement. PA-18-484. Does anybody know what the PA stands for? Chris, do you have anything yet? I got nothing yet. I got some quiet people here virtually. Okay. PA stands for, can you make guess after what we were just talking about? Parent. It's a parent announcement. So it means it's a it's a broad and it also tells you actually quite a there. <laughs> But it also lets you know that it's going to be one of those broad announcements, so it's going to be initiated by the PI. 18, does anybody have a guess what that 18 might be for? Near. 
it's the year. So I'm just going to say this now. If a PI comes to you with a with this solicitation, <laughs> the first thing you're going to do is you're going to say, this is not the most recent solicitation. You Google it and you say, if you if you type in this solicitation number, it actually will it'll give you the updated. It'll give you an updated one. It'll show mm -hmm. it on the next slide and I'll show you that at that time. And then the 484 is actually the serial number. It's the number assigned by the institution. Um, also note that it says companion funding opportunities. Notice how this one says clinical trial not allowed. Mm -hmm. This one down here is a clinical trial required. So if you're in an area where they're doing clinical trials, make sure that you use the correct one. Right. Let's see. We go to the next one. Okay, so the next one, this is actually a snapshot of section four, application and submission information. This is an area where you're going to get as a research administrator, helping with creating the proposal, submitting the proposal. This is where you get a ton of the information that you need. You're going to want to make sure that you take your table of page limits where it's blue is actually a link so you can just click on it and it'll take you right to where you need to go. If you haven't done um, an NIH in a while or if you haven't done them yet type thing, this SF or too far RNR application guide, that's what's going to give you all of the nitty gritty details that you have to have. Actually, we'll walk you through filling out the SF for the whole, actually the whole um, proposal. And then there's other information. There's also, this one actually turned out to be a really good example because when I said to reach a solicitation very carefully, this one, it usually says all instructions in the SF424 guide must be followed. Notice how all those say that. We get down here with the following additional instructions. So if you didn't pull the solicitation and really read it, you would have missed the fact that a resource sharing plan was required on this one. I think they might be required on them now in general. Um, so just make sure that you really do pay attention to that. It might look the same at a glance, but then suddenly there's that one statement that can actually get the proposal dumped before they even review it. And then we're going to talk about proposal preparation. If you would go to the next one, please. So proposal preparation, this is just a bunch of information that you kind of have to be aware of. All of it's in that page that was before here. You can kind of, you can get to all of this information going through the guides and everything. But this is stuff that you do want to be careful of. There's a limit to your file names. Your file names really need to be descriptive. They also should not have a, a space in them which KR will tell you that if you put a space in um, a, in a document and then you put it in the, Chris help me, um, the proposal tab under the attachments, it will throw an error. So you have to have- It will throw a limits. warning, sorry. A warning, Maura, let's warning. be careful. Thank you. Warning, not error, sorry. Um, and that's in KR, that's not in the other. Um, assist system. So what I'll do is you want to run your file names together or put underscore um, in between the spaces or instead of spaces. Font size is important. Um, make sure that you're paying attention to what the font size is and you really want to work on consistency. When I do a proposal that has several words, I email the several word people and I tell them this is the font that we're using. Please use the same to the best of their ability. Sometimes they don't, and I can't argue with that too much. Page limits is huge. You gotta make sure that you're paying attention to the page limits. That will get it dumped before they even look at it for the review. Excuse me, will you get an error uh, when you're doing the validation, mm -hmm. if there's a, like a file name issue or something like that? Will I, will I know that? Like a file name, like I have an underscore or something. In assist? Yeah, in assist. You, there is a, I always run it. I have an assist that I will be doing next week, um, but you do run, um, you can run it for errors and have it checked for errors and it'll come back with warnings and errors, whichever. So if you run that when you're doing the assist record, it'll let you know if there's a, also can never say it enough. Do not submit a proposal on the day that it's due, if at all possible to avoid it. Go at least a day before. So if there are issues on something, your SR or your research administrator at OSP is able to go on and help you get the fixes that you need for it to go through. 
If you go and you submit a proposal 10 minutes before it's due and it doesn't go through, it's not going to go through. So I think your question was, will it tell you specifically what your error is or your warning? Is that what you asked or does it just give basically, you? basically, mm -hmm. does it tell you specifically? Okay. It, it, it should, but what, what I'm interested in is whether it actually catches things like that. Sometimes you submit something, right? And uh, for some reason, the application is disqualified because of a simple thing like that. That's what I'm trying to. I I, I think there's stuff that does go get you know get through without an error or warning that might. Chris, do you have any feedback for us? It's been a year and a half since I submitted one. I don't remember. Yeah. So NIH has the most robust data validation checking of any federal agency. All of their systems are designed to tell you exactly what is definitely wrong with your application, and they do provide a lot of warnings which may or may not apply. So again, um, I think to um, the question, you have to know a little bit about what NIH is requiring in order to figure out what the warnings are trying to tell you. But they do tell you a lot. Yes, yeah, so, so the warnings and the errors, they will tell you, it'll at least tell you enough that you need to be looking for something. Your research administrator, if, if you go through OSP, which I think everybody does unless, there's a few people that can submit out of the out of their colleges, but um, it it will get determined and they'll figure out what it is. So and just a point of my frustration because if I'm I'm doing an NSF or an NIH or a USDA and they do have very different they do. Uh, requirements for the file names, file sizes, etc., and I get sometimes you know confused mm -hmm. and then I want. To and some system that will help me. <laughs> so I can, towards the end, there will be some checklists that I have that you can create something like what I have that will maybe help you with some of that. So next slide, please. So we're going to talk about the project narrative and the project summary abstract. First off is the project narrative. It's limited to three lines. I think two to three lines, usually three lines. Um, and you really do have to watch that. It's amazing at how long a PI can make a sentence, but mm -hmm. make sure that they did make it that long and they didn't accidentally put a period in there and you now have four sentences. Um, the project narrative communicates the public relevance of the project to the public. What is not up here is the fact that it really needs to touch base on the IC, the institution or center. Each of those institution or centers that we mentioned at the beginning, Julie did those, those each have their own mission statement. For example, the NIAID, that's one that I submit to a lot. Their mission statement is to conduct and support basic and applied research to better understand, treat, and ultimately prevent infectious, immunological, and allergic diseases. So those three sentences in some way need to address how this proposal is going to affect that. Um, when I first started, the PIs had no clue what it was. They just wrote three sentences about their, their work and that was that. The project summary is a succinct and accurate description of the proposed work, 30 lines of text or less. If it goes over 30 lines, it'll, be, it'll get kicked back. Um, it should be informative to persons working in the same or related fields and understandable to a scientifically literate re, um, reader. One of the things to know about both of these is that these are documents that will be released to the public if it is awarded. So you do want to make sure that there's somewhat of a layperson aspect to it, that they can understand it. Of course, this one has got a lot of details, so we're looking for it to be um, the, the scientific literate reader, like it says on that one. And then it's yeah. you. Next slide, we're going to talk about detailed and modular budgets. So NIH supports both direct and indirect or f &A costs. Sometimes the caps are on direct costs, sometimes on total costs. Read your FOA, know your limits, carefully read um, the FOA for budget criteria. Look for limits on the types of expenses, for example, the construction, uh, spending caps on certain expenses like travel might be limited to $10,000 and overall funding limits, total costs, or if total costs cannot exceed $300,000 per year. Next slide. Uh, when calculating 
whether your direct cost is 500,000 or greater, do not include any subrecipient F&A in the base, but do include all other direct costs as well as any equipment. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, when you request 500,000 or more for direct costs in any year, you must uh, contact a scientific or research contact and receive approval from the funding agency at least six weeks prior to submitting the application. My typo said six months. That's when she looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and you must follow the policy on acceptance for review of unsolicited applications that request 500,000 or more indirect costs as described in the SF-424 or in our application guide. Next slide. What is a modular budget? So the reason for modular budgets is to help reviewers keep focused on uh, the scientific merit of the proposal, not the amount of the proposal or the details of the budget. NIH uses the modular format to request up to a total of 250 of direct costs per year in modules of 25,000, excluding the consortium or subaward F&A costs. For some applications, rather than requesting a full detail budget, this modular budget format is not accepted for SBIR and STTR grant applications. And keep in mind that CSU and the subawards still need a detailed budget, even if you're submitting a modular budget uh, for our records. And um, when we submit subawards, we include a copy of the scope of work, the budget, and a budget justification with all subawards. So a modular budget versus a detailed budget. Um, I'm kind of read this, but basically <laughs> it's it's just what she was just saying. Your detailed budget, usually an R01 is a detailed budget. It can be a modular budget. I've forgotten about that because I've never done one as a modular. An R03 is definitely going to be a modular budget. R21 is a modular budget. Um, and then I honestly have no experience with these, but they are going to be, I believe that those are probably going to be detailed budgets. So basically, the, it's, it has to do with the amount of money that you're requesting. If you're requesting more than a total of $250,000 in direct costs per year, excluding the consortium F and A, then you're going, then you can, then you have to do a detail. If you're under that amount, then you can do a modular budget. Um, sometimes I don't, most of my PIs, like I said, I've never done an R01 as a modular because when they've got the R01, they've got enough information that they're going for the big money and they're going to want that 500,000 per year for five years. That's a lot more than 250,000 total or 275. <laughs> um, next slide, please. You should have access to these slides. Um, I believe that even those that are present um, in person, the slides should become available. This would be a good one to maybe keep track of if you have some place where you're you're keeping um, just your cheat sheets and things like that. It kind of walks you through how to make the decision if you're doing a modular budget or if you need to do the detailed budget. The other thing is, is if you ever have questions, just do the round around listserv. Nobody's going to think you're stupid. I thought that when I first started and they, well, when they first started, I was like, I don't want to do that. People know I don't know my job. That's not the case. They just know that, you know, sometimes we forget or we're new and we're learning. Next slide, please. Chances are, if you don't know, maybe somebody else doesn't know me. Right. That's what they kept telling me. Can I, oh, I have a um, follow-up question on the budget justification for the NH submission. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about that? It's down. It's down the road. <laughs> okay. So features of a modular budget. We kind of went through this a little bit, so I'll let you guys just read that. But I will tell you, an R03 has a budget limit of fifty thousand per year for two years equaling $100,000. That's basically a PI has an idea that they want to see if it'll work, and it's a good enough idea that NIH agrees that, yeah, maybe you should research it a little bit more. Then there's the R21. Usually that comes after an R03. Um, and it's, uh, it has a limit of 275,000 in direct costs over two years. At the most that you can ask for in any one year is 200,000. Um, Obviously, you can't or ask for the same modules. Speaking of modules, 
this is the big thing with a modular budget. It's requested in $25,000 modules. If your module comes up to 23,000, you're still going to ask for 25,000. If your budget comes up to 27,000, you're going to have to drop it down to 25,000. You don't go to the next one if you've got it. If you have it, you can go up. But if you don't have it, then you have to start crimming a little bit. It's a modular. It doesn't, what you're sending to NIH does not have all the details. So you can usually drop it in consumable supplies. If you've got consumable supplies, sometimes people reduce their effort just a little bit. Just be careful if your PI is saying, well, I'll cut it in my salary or I'll cut it in my effort. Just, you know, eventually the question, if, if they've got $30,000 that they're cutting in their effort, the question then is, can you do the work for that amount of effort? So there are times where you kind of need to ask some questions like that. And some of them don't appreciate those questions. <laughs> um, an R01 budget limit is 500,000 in direct costs annually for up to five years. I usually make sure that I come in at about 4,900 for 499,999 because it says up to 500 and then everything else says 500 or more. You have to get the a previous approval. So I never hit 500 just because I don't want to see what happens if I do that. So I'm not, I'm not that risky. I <laughs> should do 99 cents. The 99 cents. There you go. OK, the next slide, please. So this is an example of modular budget page. Um, it's very simple. This is the area. Where is the area? No, what are you looking for? This is the area that you're going to hit with your 25,000 modules, I believe. It's up there at the top. And then it does want your um, your consortium F and A put in there. The rest of this is pretty self-explanatory. It's pretty easy to to fill them out. Again, following the the R and R SF424 guideline, it'll tell you what goes into each spot. Um, my one trick on this that I would mention is if you go into year two, change your end date first, because if you try mm -hmm. to change the first date, it like wigs it out and then it's not real happy with you for a little bit. So next one, please. So modular budget justifications. There's three different types that you're going to need on a modular budget, possibly. You're going to need a personnel justification, a consortium justification, which is a subword and an additional narrative justification. Obviously, if you don't have a subboard, you don't have the consortium justification. Next slide, please. Your personnel justification. So everybody has their way of doing them, um, but they all have to cover the same amount of information. You need to list your personnel, including their names, their roles, and the person months on the project. We'll talk about person months a little bit later. Um, you do not provide any salary information on modular budgets, personnel justification. Um, you do want to ensure that you adhere to the salary cap and graduate compensation limits when um, estimating the modules. And then also ensure to adhere to the cost principles, administrative salaries, etc. when you're doing the modules. Next one. Please. So here's a sample of a personnel justification for a modular budget. Although I will say, while this is for a modular budget, you could actually take that exact same and put it into a detailed budget. It's the same information. So you just are listing your personality. You always are going to start with your PI, then your co-eyes, and then your other, um, in this case, it's a graduate assistant. Sometimes it's a lab manager. It just depends on what type of um, research they're doing. The one thing that I would do different on this is I would list key personnel and then here I would put in other personnel. So I always do that so that it makes it clear that these are the ones that we're going to track and we're saying um, that this is they are putting in 2.25 person months and we're con I guess sort of contracting. We're, we're saying this is what we're doing. We're quantifying and they can't be changed without prior approval. Um, they can change 24% of that prior approval. And then the graduate assistant, though, they can, they can kind of, you could have different graduate assistants over the period of the grant. Next one, please. Don't forget the salary cap. The salary cap. Salary cap. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. This is you. This is me. This is you. Because it's consumption. Look at me. That's you. Here we go. <laughs> So um, on the 
subaward justification, provide an estimate of the total subaward costs, direct plus indirect for each budget period rounded to the nearest thousand, list the individuals um, and, organi and organizations with whom the contractual arrangements have been made. Please indicate if foreign or domestic. Uh, list all personnel, including the names of the person, including names, person, months, and roles on the project. Do not put any salary information in the consortium justification. Next, there's an example. So my one thing, when I am one of those that sometimes it'll just have like I'll have forty-eight thousand nine hundred and <laughs> and I'll go across. because in the end I might be getting to that 57,000 and if I round it up it might take me higher and then I'm out of budget so I don't know I'm I'm sorry <laughs> I just not I don't do it right now please anyway I do it right now there you go okay all right next slide and now we're to the additional narrative additional narrative it's one of those things that's there's various things that can get put on that um, the modules, if for some reason you have a variation in the number of modules, obviously when you're doing the 275,000 R21, you are going to have a variation, so it's not expected to do the additional narrative <laughs> for that particular one because you can't avoid it. If in an, if in an R01, for example, let's say you're running around 400,000 every year, for some reason you're not asking the highest amount you're at 400,000, but one year you hit 450,000 or something like that, then you would want to make a notation as to why you're asking for significantly more money in one year than you did in the rest of the years. Um, then also, yep, I said that's not new for that. You can include quotes in that if you need to. Also, you can you need to justify any f &A exclusions or specifics. For example, let me see what do I have on this one. There were some things I wanted to make sure that we hit. Um, it should address any of the expenses not charged for f &A. Equipment doesn't get f a charged on it. Tuition doesn't get f a charged on it. If you've got that, those types of things, you do need to note on there and you do need to give dollar amounts so they can kind of do some calculations on it. The other thing is because of the fact that we're currently in a step, I call them step up. I don't know what the correct term is, but our f &A is stepping up every year, a half a percent. Mm -hmm. um, CBMBS is the college that I work with, and they actually drafted this really nice team that basically just explains what our um, f &A step up is and the fact that that's what's going to show in the budgets for the f &A. Um, Obviously, that comes into play more when you get into a five-year R01 than a two-year R21. Um, it also makes a comment in here about the fact that the university charges f and on the first 25,000 from each sub award. So this is the place where you can kind of give some of that extra information so that maybe they don't ask down the road. So next slide, please. So this is a sample of one where it looks like in one year they probably asked for an additional module in um, in the R21 and they did it specifically for the fact that they had um, the that spectrum spectrometer that was going to be the equivalent of one whole module. So, OK, next please. Detailed budget samples. This is still in. It is still you. It is still it's just OK, so we Remember what the modular budget looked like when it was one page? Okay, so there's this page. Next page. There's this page. Next page. This page. <laughs> and then there's this, oh, this page. And then there's another page that will bring up all the totals. Next piece. <laughs> We're doing it back up. She's keeping me away. <laughs> I am. Okay, so this one, it's, it's really pretty simple filling this out. Again, you'll want, as you add your budget periods, watch and change your end date first. Obviously, I miss that almost every time. Um, project versus sub award. This is a detailed budget. So we shifted our thought process from modular to detailed. Once we hit this, then you're going to be giving a whole lot more information. Um, 
you start with your PI, you put them in there. If this is where your calendar months and your uh, person months come in. The thing with this is basically the way you calculate, I'm gonna see if I can find my notes or if I can do it off the top of my head. The way you calculate your person months is if you're, if the person on it, whether it's the PI, co-PI, whoever it is, if they are working a nine month position, then basically three quarters of it is going to be put in the academic months and one quarter is going to go into the summer months. So if you take one calendar month, they've got 0.75 in, in the academic and 0.25 in the summer month. There's lots of little calculators out there for how to calculate it. Um, I actually have a spreadsheet that I just made myself that I use. So if you need that information, once again, just reach out on the round around somebody, you'll probably get inundated with a lot of them and you can figure which one you want. Um, and then down here is where you're going to put all of your other personnel, clearly says that. Um, and then it kind of does its calculations, but what's nice with this is you basically take it right out of KR and you put it into this form. So it really is pretty simple. Next point. This one, if you have equipment, and then if you have travel. I've never done participant training support costs, so I can't speak to that. Um, if you get to that and you have questions on it, Brenna, that's a, <laughs> that place will answer all your questions. Just email. Next one, please. This is where you break it down, where you've got your materials and supplies, publications. It's pretty self-explanatory. When you get into here, one of the things I did want to say, in KR, we separate materials and supplies from other direct costs. NIH doesn't. It's all under NI and under other direct costs. So make sure that you kind of catch that. Where I work, we have animals, which we, which they actually go under materials and supplies, but their care, the per diem, goes under other direct costs, number eight. And I actually break it out as a per diem. Um, so I usually do that with anything that's like a significant amount. I, I note what it is and I put the dollar amount over here. But then if I have a bunch of little other direct costs, then I'll just kind of lump them in and just call them other direct costs and put them in line 10 or I don't know where. Then the rest of it's pretty self-explanatory what you're putting in there. Um, and you attach your budget justification. And next. And then this is just, it's a cumulative budget. Whatever you put in the first pages loads into this. So it's all done for you automatically. You can skip the next one. To the next. Detailed budgets, personnel. Is it still me? It's still you. It's still me. Okay. She's got all the knowledge. I do. Um, so this is pretty. The salary cap requesting above the salary cap is kind of one of those things. Different people do it differently. I think it goes from department, from colleges. Everybody's doing does it a little bit differently. Just know the NIH will not pay over the salary cap. Some will say, but if you don't ask for it in outlying years, then they won't, then you can't get it. It just kind of varies on that. Um, and so I would say on that, you want to talk to your department level higher up or your college level higher up. Senior key personnel should be limited to those from applicant or who are dedicating effort. Um, that's one of the things that you want to be careful with. I have PIs that they, I have one particular PI who likes to have, um, he likes to put students and postdocs on it because they need, they, they need that. It's good for them. What's better for them and less of a headache for us is if they get publications. And so that's what we finally have talked about is if they're getting the publications, that's what people are going to see. They're not going to notice that they were a, you know, a key person on this grant necessarily. They can still list the grant. <clears throat> so, but if they do list a grad student and the grad student leaves and they're listed as a key person, it takes a lot of effort on our part, on the department part, on OSP's part to get them removed from the grant. So, and that right there is telling you that they can be, we just don't really recommend it. Um, tuition should not be included in grad students' compensation limits. It should go under other. There is an area on the um, 
on the budget that actually, actually, no, there's not an area on the budget that asks for their tuition that goes under other direct costs also. So don't put it under their salary. It's a separate item. And other personnel should also be limited, should be listed by their role on the project. So I have one that has a lab manager that's been with them for many, many years. So that lab manager is on most all the proposals because they do a lot of the work. And they have a lot, they have a skill set that looks really good on the proposal. So they want to make sure that that's out there and they can see it. Next, please. Still, still to you? No. Okay. So this is travel and tra equipment travel trainees costs. Training costs I've never had, so I can't speak to that. Um, I will say the equipment, you do want to make sure that you're kind of listing what it is. Also, it's kind of important if a PI, especially if you have like a newer PI maybe, but if a PI has talked about the fact that they might be getting equipment or they might need <clears throat> equipment, ask them about that so that you can put it in the budget. Because if you don't put it in the budget, you have to get permission. You have to get prior approval from an IH. Um, even if the funds are there because they're going to cut out this part or whatever, it's really hard. And, and I, we tried to do it a few years ago when the pandemic started. Um, and it was such a pain that we just ended up not following up with it. Um, travel, whenever possible, should be justified by the destination, number of people, dates, or duration of the stay, and how the travel is directly related to the proposed pro activities. It's not a lot of PIs are just kind of like, oh, I've got that much. Oh, just put in travel. I'll use it for travel. They really do want to know what they're going to be traveling for and why, and if it's actually legit. So next one. Materials and supplies. We talked earlier about the fact that animals are materials and supplies, <laughs> but their per diem is under is under other direct publications is under other direct consultants. These, if you notice, all of these were actually, well, not the animal costs, but these were listed in that budget page earlier. So you do want to break them out accordingly in the budget page. Um, with the animal costs, with the per diems, in the budget justification, you do want to kind of break out um, how many, like I'll put in there that we are getting 45 hamsters and they'll be caged. So they're cage days, because you can put four hamsters to a cage. It's sad that I know this. Um, and it's 425 a day in BSL-3. So I actually would write that out and I always use the word estimated because we're estimating, we don't know for sure. Things change. Okay, next. Alterations. So there is your tuition. You can put tuition in there. Maybe. Unless it's unless it's under patient care class, then you wouldn't be able to. So this is I honestly tuition is the only one I do here. Other is where I think you get those breakdowns on that sheet where you can start listing anything that's very specific. If you have BSL three fees and it's two hundred or twelve hundred dollars a month, then you want to put that in there. And next. Consortium and subawards. Okay. I think I'm doing this when you're doing the next one. So each consortium, if you're doing an R01 and you have three subawards on it, each one of them must have an independent budget. They must have an independent budget justification and they must have an independent scope of work or statement of work, however you want to say it. Um, the consortium F and A costs are not included as part of the direct cost base. We keep saying that because for years, my PIs, they would get so excited when I'd come at the end and I'd be like, you have $25,000 that you have to spend now so we can get the proposal in because I kept putting the F&A costs for the subboard in the final amount. <laughs> and they can pay, they can spend $25,000 in like really fast. So I think that's it with this one. Mm -hmm. Next one, please. The next one is you, the consortium F&A, the next one. Um, so just remember that NIH limits the F and A for foreign organizations to eight percent. Um, this is a good reminder too at this point to ask them for the completed and signed um, CSU subrecipient commitment form or their FTP letter. Um, make sure if you have a foreign 
um, subward to start early asking for the budget and the justification. And I'll actually add to that. If you have a subaward, start early. If you have a subaward, go earlier from the foreign country, really early on that because it can take literally weeks for them to respond. So, all right, next slide. And then on the out years, um, use a reasonable ex reasonable approximation. Um, NIH has a 3% cap on inflation. And if you have any large variations year to year, you should describe that in your budget justification. For example, if you have money set aside for consultants only in the final year of your budget, um, be sure explain, to explain that in your justification. Sometimes, um, depending on the type of work that a PI does, they might have sequencing. Sequencing can be extremely expensive. So suddenly there's a $30,000 charge and you're in the final year of the project. Most federal sponsors question why you're going up in the last year like that. Next slide. Um, so then we have post submission materials. Um, there are quite a few PIs that want to submit things to NIH after they submitted their proposal. For example, if they've had um, something published, you can submit that through um, the just in time. Um, NIH sends an automatic just in time notification to everyone who gets an overall impact score of 30 or less. Don't, and so some PIs would be like, yeah, I'm getting funded. I need to submit this. Well, they don't. Um, it's just a heads up. And then when they get an email from um, the program manager, grant manager, then they specify exactly what they need for the just in time and they give you a deadline date. That's the one you really need to submit. However, if they want to submit the first one, they can. I mean, it's then it's done. Yeah, it's done, but some things may change. But they do need to be submitted by the CSU business official, not by you guys or by the PIs. And do those come? Does that the notification go straight to the PI? It comes to um, well, it used to. It I mean, it come, it goes to the PI and to sponsor and program. to sponsor program. To so, the RA so if you're a department person, you don't know this. They just come in your office all excited mm -hmm. that they got a grant. Or, or, you know, and it's like, so then you have to be careful about getting. Yeah, ask them, to see, ask them to see the email. If it's from a grants manager, then yeah. they they need to submit it. Otherwise, it's just, some, and I think a lot of them know that by now, but some of the new PIs. We have new ones coming. Though. Yeah. So, okay. How are we doing? Fine. We're almost done. Now. I, don't know. I, don't know. I think we're changes. We're almost done. Okay. Next one, please. And once again, we get to change our forms. We're going from forms G to forms H. Have any of you guys been around for a forms change at NIH before? Chris, what do you see out there in the audience? I think they're all sleeping. Else? My audience is not raising their hands, but I know that people, people have. Got, so we'll say that you haven't been part of this. And I took my note on this over across. So, January 2023, that makes it sound really innocuous. It's just going to be, oh, in January, they're going to change forms. It's not that easy. In January, they're going to change forms, yes. If your due date is on January 25th or after, you have to use Forms H. If your due date is on January 24th or earlier, you have to use Forms G. Now, if you have a PI, I actually do have a PI like this. I've got some dream PIs. I realize that. I have a PI that will send me a proposal completed and ready to go a month before it's due. So, I know, right? Right. Amazing. <laughs> you weren't there. You were there before. So, the problem is, is if I were to start that in, um, in assist, I need to make sure that I'm choosing the right forms packet. Mm -hmm. It's been a bit since I remember um, they changed forms. It hasn't been that long, but my memory is short. Maybe that's how it should work that. So I'm not sure what it's going to look like, but what you want to do is when, when you're getting in December and January and you're working on proposals, you really do want to pay attention. If you're doing an NIH, pay attention to its due date. Make sure you're using the right forms. The other thing that will happen is ASSIST will send up warnings even if you use the right forms, which really messes me up because it's like I'm, I'm going in and triple quadruple checking to make sure that I've used the right forms because I don't want to submit with the wrong forms. Yes, they're and wanting those the guys. So they're like, oh my gosh, did right. you use the right forms? Right. So, so yeah. yeah. And it does, it does it for quite a while. It's not like just a week or two. It's 
Yeah, like so it's, it's a very special show when this is all going on. <laughs> so um, application guides for forms H application packages will be posted to the how to apply application um, application guide no later than October 25th, 2022. Um, I've already seen some information. Can you pop to the next one? Maybe it's on there. It is. Okay. It's, this is what's the big change. I've also seen some information about, yes, this one, but I will tell you, can you go back one again? I'm sorry. I'm keeping you awake, Andy. This is not the most recent notice on this. Even in the time since these slides have been made, there's been another notification that's come out on it. So if you go and you pull up this notice, you can see the other notices that have come since then, and you can keep going. Yeah, okay. so you yeah. can just click on the more recent one. Also read to the side because some of them, one of them really doesn't make that, really doesn't play into it too much for the research administrator part. Um, but yeah, you wanna make sure that you're looking at the most recent notice, but sometimes you have to look at all the notices to get all of the information because it doesn't just carry forward. And, and the biggest change is this data management and sharing policy. That's the need for the new forms is there. And I think that they were required. Right. Like they were previously recommended. Now they're required. Yeah, it's required. required. So next. OK, we're so done. this is my so this is the checklist I was talking about that I created. Um, so this is my R01 checklist. I remind myself that they can have 500,000 total direct. Um, it has all of the different documents that I would need to put on there. One of the things on the bio sketch, make sure, and I should have said this earlier, make sure that they're using the most recent form. I was just working on an NIH proposal earlier today, and I got a form, a bio sketch from somebody with 2018 for the expiration mm -hmm. date. So I, st I, I was able to take most of it and just move it over and get it done. But if there's a lot of information, it just goes back to them and they have to get it done for me because it's not really what I'm supposed to have to do. Um, if I also go through and check my page limits and I make sure that I've got my page limits on here. And then also over here, I will put like here, um, the project narrative should address how it relates to the NIH Institute and Center's mission. I share this with the PIs mm -hmm. so they know what they need to do. They know what their limitations are. They can do their own little checklist, and then I also use it as I'm putting it all into the assist system. So I have an R01. I also have down here kind of the what your font size should be. The fact that you should not put headings on there um, or footers because it does it itself. And then the next one well, is so they're highly encouraged. No, so headers and footers are no. no. These are encouraged within <laughs> your research, the big research document, whatever it's called. Or was it in the text of your attachment? So project narrative, not project narrative. Anyway, yeah. Research so strategy. Thank you. I found it just as you said that I found it. So within the research strategy, they do recommend headings because that helps the readability of it. So I will head again. There's an, I do one for an R03, which I've got to put the amount up there. And I do one for an R21 as well. Next. And then I think there might be another. There's um, NIH. Um, so can you wrap it in? And there you go. Here's the resources and everything like that. So again, this is all on the PowerPoint. You all should get it. I think if you're in person, I think you can probably get it out of an email. I think it's being posted somewhere. And too, if you have NIH questions, I Googled a lot of NIH and then my question. Yeah, you can find. I mean, it's and it's so, pretty easy to find. Sometimes stuff. it is confusing. It is confusing. So again. Just shoot out a, an email to the listserv and somebody will definitely answer. And a lot of times your RAs know that they have a lot of this. Just questions. And if you make so, sure that you're on the sign up sheet, we will uh, give you an email copy of the slide deck. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Will that include your those spreadsheet checklists you made? Well, it, it'll include the PDF of it. If you want those, you yeah. can email me and I'll be happy to, okay. to do that. Cool. So. Yeah, I'm happy to share stuff. I've got spreadsheets that I create my budgets in. I've got all kinds of stuff. And if you do click that PDF, you can export it as a um, Excel spreadsheet. Okay. Just okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. Great. She's a whiz at this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, she helped us out with me. <laughs> she helps me out with these. I tried. <laughs> it was a big fail, so I was like, yeah. 
<laughs> so Maura, there's, um, there's a comment in chat. Susan has let us know that the data management plan that will be required in January does have a template that can be used. So the data management plan is also separate than the resource sharing plan, just to be clear. Yeah. Oh, yes, Susan, yes. The other thing is you do want to check on that because there also is a template for the NIH, the project summary, I believe. Maybe not. No, I'm confusing my sponsors. That's USDA. Sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But it is good to I check do. for templates and you can also look for samples. Um, the biographical sketch, as I was going through to send stuff to a PI who sent me the wrong format today, I just pulled all of it and I sent it to him and I said, it needs to be on this format. And these are your explanations of why. And that was that. So they do have a lot of the information. Google and mm -hmm. Google it and get onto the NIH site. I would be careful making sure that you're on an NIH site and you're not on another university. Other universities or businesses, it sometimes their explanation helps a little bit, but you want to make sure that you have true NIH documentation. Because that would not be good. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions, Chris? No other questions in chat. We know that Susan was awake. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> you all have a good evening. Thank you. So just a reminder, there's a survey. We'd like you to fill out the survey. Um, I put the blah, put the link in chat. Um, if you have any questions about the recording or the slides, you can contact us at the OSP info address. And on behalf of the OSP Training and Professional Development Committee, thank you for your participation and a special thanks to Mara and Julie, our presenters, and Andy, our technical resource. Thank you. And to Chris, our moderator. And to Chris, our moderator. Yay! Teamwork. Whoop, whoop. I've just done that.